Amen. Gentlemen, can you pull up John 8, 31 and 32? Amen. The Bible says, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. All I kept hearing this week was the word continue, 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 continue. Don't stop. Continue. Somebody say continue. Look at your other neighbor and say don't stop. Continue. 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 Amen. That's the name of the message. Continue. Amen. Father, we just thank you tonight for the awesome opportunity to minister your word. And Father God, let it go forth in power uh, with your wisdom, your insight. Father God, I uh, pray you give me utterance uh, to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would want me to speak. Father God, uh, give me words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of understanding. Father God, just uh, words of boldness to speak to your people, Father God, to edify the body of Christ here at the Lighthouse Freedom Center and those that are watching uh, online, Father God, let me be edified as the word is going for built up, Father God, above the situations and circumstances that are going on in the world. Father God, I thank you would, would not just be information, but let it be an impartation of your spirit to bring the grace of God. So we'll not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So, Father, I thank you for what you're going to do in advance in Jesus mighty name. If you believe it, say amen. Notice the qualification to be a disciple is if you continue in his word. Somebody say his word. His word, not man's word, not my opinion, his word. What is his word? It's the written word and it's the spoken word that comes from God Almighty himself. To walk in this word is gonna take a disciplined approach to block out all other words and the focus on his word. One of the areas the Lord has been dealing with me is a complete commitment, dedication, and focus to his word that is crucial um, to uh, me continuing at the level and um, with the, with the uh, responsibilities that he has put on my life. We, I was talking to Pastor Riley. I said, we got to double up. That uh, because a lot of churches have chosen to close, those that are still uh, continuing with the mission, amen, it's like... 10 people carrying a load and then five people step out from under the load. Well, the weight of the five just increased. Amen. So you got to double up. Amen. Our spiritual capacity so we can continue uh, with the mission that God has for our lives. You know, there are a lot of ideals out there, opinions and viewpoints, but few are using the raw, unfiltered word of God to sift their ideals and opinions. Or people are taking scriptures to justify a personal belief system. Somebody say, stick with the word. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Just stick with the word of God. Amen? Gentlemen, pull up 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16 through 17. It says, every scripture has been written by the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. It will empower you by its instruction and correction, somebody say correction. Let me say this about correction. The Bible says whom the Lord loves, he corrects. He said if you be without correction, you're basically like a son without a father. But God demonstrates his correction, to, his love towards us sometimes in the form of correction. By its instruction and correction. Somebody say correction is a good thing. It's not coming to destroy me. Is coming to make me better. Instruction and correction giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the paths of godliness. Then you will be God's servant, fully mature, perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment that God gives you. Say, somebody say, I need the word to fulfill the assignment of God in my life. 
Because what it is, the word shows me how to do it God's way. Not my way, God's way. We want to do it God's way. What does the word say? And we want to do it how the word says. Because when we do it God's way, we're ensured success and victory. Because God watches over his word to perform it. Somebody say, give me the word. I don't want an opinion. I want the word of the living God. So will you continue in his word? Your continuing is connected to your commitment. And your commitment is connected to your relationship with God. Somebody say relationship. This is probably the main point of this whole message. God's been it has drilled this relationship. Gentlemen, pull up Luke 7 47. Jesus said, Wherefore I say unto you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much to whom to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. The depth of your relationship is connected to your understanding of what God has done for you. Let me say it again. The depth of your relationship with God is connected to your understanding of what God has done for you. Gentlemen, 1 John 4, 19. You know, sometimes you don't want to pull out all these scriptures and the guys are, no, get, it, get the word out. Amen? So they know it's not your opinion. <laughs> first John 4, 19. Listen to this. He says, we love him because he first loved us. Our love for him is a response of his love for us. You think you love God first. No, God loved you first. Amen? All of your life, there have been interventions of his love on your behalf, and you didn't even realize it. When you got saved, it was simply your introduction to the one that had been there the whole time waiting for you to respond to his love. <laughs> you think you just got out the car wreck and just walked out of that thing without being killed and everybody else got killed? You think it was just your good idea not to go to the club the night they shot the place up? You think it was, it, it was just your uh, uh, good luck that you didn't OD when the guy or the girl next to you OD'd? No, that was the love of God, the grace of God watching over you, knowing that there would come a day and a time and a season where you would respond to his love. And realize that it was not by it was not luck, it was not chance, it was not hocus pocus, but it was the love of Almighty God. The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, some people think they made up their mind to came, come to God. I made up my mind to come to Jesus. Somebody say, go, to, go back, go to the word. Gentlemen, pull up John 6, 44. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. So you didn't make up your mind to come to God. It was the, the spirit of God. God's the father God that drew you and pulled you out of and, and made you tired of the, of, of, of the sin that you were in. One day you just got tired and you wanted to come out. Who made you tired? That was the grace of God that, that brought your heart and your spirit to a place where I can't do this no more. I can't live like this no more. What do you, you think you just changed your mind to do that? That was the grace of God saying, I can't leave her. I can't leave him in this destructive mode because eventually they're going to kill themselves. So I got to change their mind. It's like the prodigal son that was in the hog pen. The Bible says that he came to himself. He realized I'm in a mess. I could be living better at daddy's house. And he had a change of mind, a change of heart. Where did that come from? That was the grace of God. That was the love of God to pick him up because God said, I can't override your free will. I got to get your heart, your mind, and your spirit to come in line with my will for your life. So I'm just going to breathe on you and get you tired of the mess so you can come out of it and respond to my love. He drew you by his spirit. It wasn't you. You didn't make up your mind. You were on your way to hell, and God Almighty intervened into your life to rescue out of the fire. That's why I'm saying you can't frustrate 
the grace of God. If you're born again, you got saved, you got to celebrate because that did not happen by osmosis. That was heaven intervening into your life and bringing you to a place into personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be honored. You should celebrate it. There's a value to your salvation. There's a value to your life with God. There's a value. This is not cheap. Jesus had to pour it all out and lay his life down to bring you into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ it wasn't an easy thing it couldn't be paid with silver and gold he had to shed his blood forget skin in the game he shed his blood to bring you into a relationship with him people that have a true relationship with God they cannot live without God Somebody say, it's not an option. I got to have God in my life. I got to have Jesus in my life. Gentlemen, pull up John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know you and the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So life, according to the scriptures, is really in knowing God. There is no life outside of a relationship with God because it's all temporal, it's all fading. But listen, when you, when you come into relationship with God, you're living in eternity right now. You're connected to the one that holds eternity all together. You're not disconnected, trying to get connected. You're already connected to eternity himself. That's why if the whole thing goes down, you go up because you're connected to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. People that have a relationship with God have no option when it comes to serving God. Everything they do is out of their relationship with the Lord. People with a true relationship with God don't get caught up in foolishness. They would not allow anyone to knock them out of the plan of God. They are more of the agenda of God in their lives than the agenda of people or even their own agendas. What is God's agenda? What is God saying? What is God's program? What is God's plan? What, what, is, what, what does God want to do? I want to get with God's plan. I want to be a part of his team and what he's doing. I don't want my agenda. I don't want other people's agenda. I want a kingdom agenda. Listen, if you're a part of this church, I want you to know you're in a kingdom agenda. This is a ministry that's been around for 68 years. That God's hand has been on it to sustain it through storms, through ups and downs. And even through this recent pandemic, the hand of God is on this ministry to sustain it through the ups and downs. And that's why we're still here. It's not our great thinking. It's not our prayer life. It's the grace of almighty God that's on this place because this place is fulfilling his mission. People with a relationship don't have time for foolishness. They are God-centered, God-focused. They have de dedicated, devoted their lives to continue with God. Now listen, it is possible to have a relationship with the things of God and have no relationship with God himself. I better say that one again. <laughs> it is possible to have a relationship with the things of God and have no relationship with with God himself. It is possible to be more connected to your favorite preacher and be into him and have no relationship with God. Some people, the depth of their relationship is the, the preacher that they watch in the morning. They don't talk to God. They're not hearing from God. They depend on that certain individual, listen, to hear and to dictate their relationship with God. Now, listen, you might start off with that, but listen, that's, that's baby food. Eventually, God wants you to grow up and come to him yourself, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain grace and mercy in time of need. Because, listen, God does not like idols, and he's a jealous God. He might deal with it for a little while. All right, all right, all right, that's nice. All right, all right, but hey, 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 I'm the one that gave him that message. I'm the one that put those words in his mouth. Won't you come up to me now? 
Because if God shuts the whole thing down, you stop receiving from him. That's God trying to give you an indicator. It's trying to come to me because I want you to receive from me. How many people know God can control what you receive? I ain't receiving nothing. Turn that off. God is saying, good, finally, at last. Now get on your knees. Come to the throne of grace. Let's talk. Let's fellowship. Tell me what's going on with, with your life. Tell me what's going on. I, mean, I know you're good at calling your girlfriend, calling your best friend, but I want to hear it. I want to hear it. Let it all rip. Tell, tell me. Get mad. Tell, tell, tell me what's going on in your life so I can breathe on you, so I can take that heavy burden, so I can give you a light burden and, and just breathe on you and lift you up and build you up and you can feel my love. I've been working in your life all this time, and now you come into relation with me, and now you're going to play like I'm not here? Somebody say a jealous God. He said his name is jealous. <laughs> you don't want nobody before him. He's saying, listen, I bought my son to tear down the walls. So there's no priest in between me and you. There's no preacher in between me and you. There's no brother, no sister that you can come yourself to my, to my throne of grace and receive grace and mercy in a time of need. Notice he said, if you continue in my word, you are, are my disciples. That word if means conditional, if you continue. Let me ask you a question. Is there any condition that could arise that would stop you from continuing in the word? Don't answer. It's just a question. Matter of fact, don't answer too quick. <laughs> it's a question. Is there any situation that could arise that will stop you from continuing in the word. You know, Joshua and Caleb had a relationship with God. The other people had a relationship with God by way of Moses. And these people were the biggest complainers, doubters, and unbelievers that God had ever dealt with up to that time. They tried to live off of Moses' relationship with God, and they had a victim mentality. People that have a relationship with God have conviction. They don't take it lightly, anyone coming against God's kingdom, and they are willing to stand against all opposition. You see, that's why I've, I've been so passionate through this thing, because my, my relationship with God uh, started one-on-one -on -one with God saving me in a jail cell. So the one that saved me came into my life, and, he, and I, 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 I see his hand in my life all these years, not saying everything has been fine and, 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 and just fluffy. And there's been some difficult time, but it's, I, I've seen his faithfulness. He's spoken to me and I speak to him. I vent to him and he's a friend. The Bible says that sticks closer than a brother. I can feel his presence. I can feel his strength. When I feel like I can't go any further, all of a sudden his strength kicks in and I feel his presence, his anointing, his glory, his faithfulness. And, and I'm, I'm like, God, if it was not for you, I realize that I would not be here. I will either be in jail or I'll be uh, 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 dead right now or OD or still out there on the streets if it was not for your intervention and you saved my life and I'm willing to give my life for you because you gave your life for me. God, you could have turned the other way and let me slam my life into the wall and I could have just been another casualty, another statistic. I could have been like the friend that I grew up with across the street. He died. And listen, God chose me and I didn't die, but I could have had the same outcome as him and it was the grace of God. So to, to me, I know I'm not in debt to him but I see it as an obligation to stand up for the one that stood up for me when I was down in life and now things are coming against his kingdom and his church so I feel that I cannot stand back I got to stand up for the one that set me free and delivered me I just can't do it and people that have a relation with God have a conviction 
about the things of God. They have a conviction about the things of God. A man or a woman with a conviction is hard to stop because a conviction is a strong belief that you are willing to die for. You are willing to go to jail for. When you got a conviction that comes from Almighty God, it's hard for the storms and the winds to change your mind or people to change your mind because it did not come from people. It did not come from the persuasion of man. It came from heaven. It was heaven's persuasion that convicted you that convinced you that this is the way that Jesus is the truth the life and the only way and if you're gonna lay your life down lay it down for him I was sharing with Pastor Rao I'm like what are, what, what's, what's everybody waiting for what was every, every message we've ever heard every sermon we've ever preached Every prophetic word we ever heard is for this time right here. We're in the end times. What are we waiting for? We're, we, this is not the time to shut down. This is the time to kick it up a level. This ain't the time to be quiet. This is the time to, to vocalize our faith and what we've been leaving for because God is about to do a grand finale. We're at the door. Jesus is coming back soon. He's about to wrap this thing up and pack it up like a suitcase. And I'm like, what are they waiting for? What are they waiting for? And listen, I just can't get around to the picture of this. Us going up to heaven. Apostle Paul there. Peter's there. Everybody's there. We all at the, the, the marriage lamb dinner. They sitting across from, from us. And then we there, they, they like, man, I lost my head for the gospel. I got crucified upside down for the gospel. I'm like, oh my God. What happened with y'all during y'all time? Oh, we had a virus hit and we uh, shut our church down and we went online. You know what they would say? How did you get in here? You shut who you shut you shut what down? Wait, we died? <laughs> we were there at the birth of the church so this thing could take off and you shut down for not even a visible enemy but an invisible enemy? I don't want that to be my testimony. I want to be like, listen, hey, there's some crazy virus with some political stuff attached to it. And they're trying to tell us to shut the church down. And our church took a stand and said, no, we ain't shutting down. We come into the house of God. We're going to worship God. We're going to bless the Lord. We don't love our lives unto death. We're willing to lay our lives down for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got an eternal perspective. I'm not just looking at the next 20, 30 years. I'm looking at eternity. The eternal ramifications, eternal ramifications. Right now, eternal ramifications are being set by how we react to what's going on in the world. It's going to determine what rewards we get in heaven. It's going to determine what conversations we have with past martyrs. Is it going to be a conversation of, of celebration and rejoice or a conversation of shame? You didn't stand up for the gospel. Some people have a greater awareness and reality of, of man than God. David was a man of conviction. He was a man that had a relationship with God. Even God himself said this of David. He's a man after my own heart. He recognized the pursuit of, he recognized David's pursuit after himself. So it's not surprising when God was looking for the next king of Israel, he came looking for the guy that had been chasing him, the guy that had a relationship with him. He came looking for, for David. The one that was being sought came after the one that was the seeker. God jumped over all of David's brothers, whom I'm sure on paper were more qualified, more dignified than David. But they lacked the greatest quality, the greatest ingredient that God was looking for, and it was a relationship with him. 
I think God said, how are you guys going to work for me and you don't even know me? 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, gentlemen. It says, just look at your own calling, believers. Not many of you were considered wise according to human standards. Not many powerful or influential. Not many high of noble birth. But God has selected for his purpose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. Sometimes man think they know everything and don't know nothing. Sometimes God got to use some foolishness to show that he's God, that he's the one that put the brain in your head and don't think that you're smarter than him. I got a degree. Well, God put the brain in your head to get a degree. Don't think your degree makes you smarter than him. The foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. And God has selected for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, revealing their frailty. God has selected for his purpose the insignificant base things of the world and the things that are despised and treated with contempt, even the things that are nothing, so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are. So that no one will be able to boast in God in the presence of Almighty God. Somebody say his pick of David seemed foolish. In the natural, it would have appeared that God got a little personal because David was uh, in relation with him and lost his business mind by choosing this young boy. But one thing you must remember, God is never wrong. Let me say that again. God is never wrong. The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Anybody ever go try to get a job and they want to check you out? You must understand this about God before he chooses anyone. He's already did a background check. But listen to this. He's already done a future check. See, we can only do the background. God does the background and the future. I'm going to use your background to qualify you for now. And I see what you're going to do in the future. And I say, approve. You're my man. You're my lady. See, a lot of times people are judging you from your background check, but God is judging you by your, your, your future check and seeing that, 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 that you have changed and been transformed by his power and his relationship has transformed you and your future is looking brighter than ever. So God said, that's my man, that's my lady. I see what you're going to do. Gentlemen, pull up Romans 8.29. Say, Pastor Tom, can you back that up with scripture? You got it. You got it. You got it. Listen to this. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He did foreknow. Say, God knows me <laughs> before I knew him. A lot of people have all the outside dressings and the Christian lingo. But they don't have the substance. Somebody say substance. Hebrews 11 one says now faith is the substance of things hoped for and it's the evidence of things not seen. You will know if you have the goods when pressure hits your life. An airplane ascending off the ground, leaving the earth, going to a higher level, they have to increase the pressure on the inside of the plane to withstand the pressure from the outside. Without this, the plane will be crushed like an aluminum can. Remember this principle. A prophet told me this. Make sure that your pressure on the inside is greater than the pressure on the outside. So you got to have something on the inside of you that's greater 
than, than what's on the outside. You got to fill your heart with the word of God, with the substance of the faith of the word of God. So when life squeezes, his substance comes out. His response comes out. His reaction comes out. All you're going to get is a God faith reaction when pressure hits from the outside because it just releases what you've been putting on the inside. Look at your name and say, I'm full of God. I'm full of the goodness and the power and the word and faith of God. Somebody say, get full of God. The Lord just recently told me, and sometimes he's got to remind you. I said it Sunday that God does not change. Sometimes he's got to remind you of revelations that he's given you years ago to let you know that it doesn't matter what showed up on the scene, what's going on in your world. My principles never change. And he had to remind me, didn't I tell you, don't focus on the outside, focus on your inner life, build your inner life up, and it'll begin to dictate what's going on around your life? That faith substance will begin to draw things from here or there and move things out the way that don't need to be there? If you would focus on the, in your inner life. Say, so give me some scripture on that. You got it, you got it. Let's do it. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 12. Passion. Listen to this. Though we experience every kind of pressure, we're not crushed. At times we don't know what to do, but quitting is not an option. We are persecuted by others, but God has not forsaken us. We may be knocked down, but not out. <laughs> you may have gotten knocked down, but you're not out. We continually share in the death of Jesus in our own bodies so that the resurrection life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. We consider living to mean that we are constantly being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus will be revealed through our humanity. So then death is at work in us, but it releases life in you. See, sometimes pressure can actually work for you because you sometimes you don't know what you got until the pressure hits and you don't realize, my God, there's more to me than I thought. That it's been paying off my meditation time, my prayer time, my worship time. And my God, because that's all that's coming out in response to the pressure that's coming from the outside. Somebody say, get full of God. A lot of pressure, but we're still here. Attack, but we come back. God picked the right man. He picked a man who wouldn't be crushed by pressure. Goliath, even though he was an enemy of Israel, Goliath actually helped to prove that God got it right. Sometimes don't look at enemies as all bad. Sometimes they are a confirmation of what God is doing in your life because sometimes you can, you can say, I won't quit. Sometimes you can say, I'm not going to throw in the towel. But when people, and people can hear you and be like, yeah, yeah, we'll see. You know what they say? We'll see. And what are they saying? We'll see what? When the Goliath shows up. When Goliath shows up on the scene. When the giant shows up on the scene. Now we want to see your reaction. And by your reaction to that, they know you got the goods. He picked the right man. God knew David was a giant slayer. He knew that when he was put in an awkward situation with the king trying to kill him, that he would still show honor. Even though he would knew he would be justified in the sight of men by getting revenge, he chose to be justified in the sight of Almighty God. Yes, of course, he made mistakes. We all do. But he was willing to make adjustments. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When Goliath showed up, he stopped Israel right in their tracks. And guess who else was in that group? All the brothers that God jumped over to get to David. They were all there. 
All them ones that the prophet said, this is surely the Lord. And the Lord was like, eh, 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 eh. None. Who else you got? Call David up. But all those guys were in the trenches hiding from Goliath. Them guys were packed up in there too. <laughs> Everybody packed up in there. It's, somebody say, except for David. You see, when you got a relation with God, you don't got to be a part of the clique. You ain't got to be a part of the club. You're just somebody that's serving God, enjoying your relationship with the Lord. And on your way, your journey, all of a sudden, an opportunity shows up to demonstrate the power of God in your life. You're not looking for it. You're not trying to promote yourself. You're just enjoying your relationship with the living God. And God just said, my God, I better use somebody with a relationship to deal with this Goliath because these guys are stuck like Chuck. And this whole, my whole army is, is stuck and nothing's moving. And I got to get somebody with a relationship to put a whipping on this giant. He stopped Israel in their tracks. God was like, then David showed up. God was like, gentlemen, thank you for proving me right. <laughs> Here comes David flowing his relationship with God. And instead of being afraid with Goliath, he got angry at Goliath. Why? What was the point? His anger was because he made this comment. What? You are defying the armies of the living God? Man, you're going down. Church, if we don't stand up for the things of God, who will? If it wasn't for David, Israel would have remained stuck. They were already stuck at that point when he came in for 40 days, a month and a half. One man had a whole army on lockdown. One virus got the whole church globally on lockdown. It ain't like multiple things going on. One thing in the land and churches have shut down. No people are like, man, he ain't going to let this closed church thing go. Nope, I ain't. Not going to stop. <laughs> you know, Mike Murdoch used to have a saying. He said, the thing that, that, that angers you is the thing that you're called to, you're a part of your assignment. It, it, listen, there, there, there is no, you know, I heard some people say, you know, we, 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 we chose to say, oh, but whatever God told you to do, Amen. Somebody say the word. No, it's not, 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 no, no. We chose to say you closed down. No, what, does, what would the word say? When have you ever heard the way it say quit? Is there anything in this Bible that ever says shut down the church? Matter of fact, is there any uh, instinct in the Bible where the New Testament church ever shut down? And you've seen the extreme conditions that the church went through in the book of Acts that were 10, 30, 40, 50 times worse than what we're going through. And they did not choose that as an excuse to shut down. The whole church was reduced from 500 and 120, decided to go up in the upper room, and it was the birth of the New Testament church. Listen, they, that, that was a scary thing. It was an illegal thing, and they chose that. Listen, we got to come together. We, got to, to, we, we can't let this thing die in Jerusalem. We got to make sure that this thing doesn't die with our generation, that there's other generations that are before us. This faith cannot die with us. Uh, Paul told Timothy, Timothy, the faith that was in your grandmother was in your mother, and I'm persuaded is in you also. God is into generational blessing, generational uh, moves of the Holy Ghost, and God does not want the move of the Spirit to die with any generation. It's not ever going to die. It will be the conclusion will be the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Then even after that, the church is coming back, riding on horses with the Lord, the commander of hosts of the armies of heaven. You can't find it where God ever tells us to shut down. Never. Nada. Can't find it. Not there. Won't find it. Somebody say, Walmart open? 
They ain't closed during no pandemic. Home Depot, I was at Home Depot today, people everywhere. They ain't closed down. They ain't closing down. So why should the church close down? No, I guarantee you there's people that will not walk in a Walmart. There are people that will not walk in Home Depot, but they don't close the whole thing down because the people that won't come because they know there's some people that will come. Say that that don't even make uh, just not even being scriptural. That doesn't even make business sense to close the whole thing down. We got to stand up for the things of God. Almost done. David stepped out and took Goliath's head off and he used the testimony that came from his relationship to whip Goliath. In the book of uh I think Exodus or Numbers, the children of Israel were confronted with giants and they were willing to forfeit the promised land because of the giants. Their action showed a lack of faith and trust in almighty God. Gentlemen, pull up that James scripture. Listen to this. You ever hear somebody say, you're talking about something, they say, I have faith. Almost like defense. I have faith. You trying to say I don't have faith? I have faith. Calm down, hold your horses, relax. <laughs> you know, you're just trying to encourage me, you know, just get in the word. You know, you, we got to believe God. I believe God. I trust God. <laughs> I'm just trying to encourage you. Why are you getting so defensive? Why are you losing your cool? Relax, I'm your friend. <laughs> Listen to this. So then faith that doesn't involve action is phony. But someone might object and say one person has faith and another person has works. Go ahead then and prove to me that you have faith without works and I will show you faith by my works as proof that I believe. You can believe all you want that there is one true God. That's wonderful. But even the demons know this and tremble with fear before him, yet they're unchanged. They remain demons. You see, when you have faith, you will never have to say, I have faith. Because your lifestyle will prove that you have faith. David didn't have to say, I have faith to whip Goliath. He went to work, and his action showed that he believed God. I guarantee you, if you ask any of those guys that were hiding in that trench, do you really believe God can beat this giant? Yeah, yeah, we believe. But their actions canceled out that confession and nullified their faith because they had faith, so they said, but no works to back it up. Somebody say it's action time. I'm all for cute little sermons, but there got to be some action backing up that sermon. See, you see, when you have faith, you will never have to say, say it to prove it. Your actions, your words will tell the real story. Notice demons believe that there is a God, but believing without conviction will never lead you to demonstrate what you believe and to enough to make an adjustment to what the word says. Uh, last scripture, gentlemen, 2 Timothy 3, 5. Listen to this. They may pretend to have a respect for God, but in reality, they want nothing to do with God's power. Stay away from people like these. Then the other translation says, they have a form of godliness, but their actions deny the power thereof. Somebody say, actions speak louder than words. Amen. Stand to your feet. Amen. Hallelujah.